Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Today, we're talking about the craft of food styling. But rather than focus on a single project, we're going to share examples from across film and television. I've got two guests here to share their expertise. First, Christine Tobin. Your credits as a food stylist include Little Women, Julia, and The Holdovers. Welcome to Below the Line. Thank you. Nice to be here. Glad to have you. I'm also excited to welcome your fellow food stylist, Melissa McSorley, whose credits include Chef, Mad Men, and numerous projects set in the Star Wars universe. Thanks for joining, Melissa. Uh Thanks for having me. And hi, Christine. Nice to see you. Hello. This is going to be a fun conversation. Listeners, because we're going to touch on multiple projects, we'll endeavor to avoid specific plot spoilers today, but do keep your ears open. If we stumble into something, we'll preface it with a spoiler alert. But before we get into specific projects, to set the table, if I can make that pun, talk to me about how food styling fits into the set organizational chart. Typically, food styling, uh, at least the way we do it here on the West Coast, and I guess we can make the differentiation that Christine may do things differently because she's on the East Coast and and there are differences. Um, Food styling usually falls under the property department. And depending on the project I'm working on, something like This Is Us and it's a a basic breakfast or lunch or dinner, uh, that falls all under the prop master and he sort of gives me my direction. Oftentimes I get hired though by the production designer or even a director that's worked with me before. Uh, when food is really integrated into the storyline. So on a movie like Chef, uh, I was interviewed all the way to the top before I got that uh, that food styling job. A couple seasons ago, I did a, a show called The Brother's Son and interacted mostly with like the director and the writer. So even though we fall under the prop department, um, I tend to take direction from many different sources depending on what the project is. It's the same here in New England. And I, lo- I love that. I love bouncing, you know, having guidance from a prop master, but then also being able to get in the stew a bit more with, you know, writers, directors, coaching, talent, sometimes costume and hair even, depending if there's something that's needing to be uh, collaborated on, but very much the same. Now, does that ever prove to be a challenge uh, where, I mean, again, I could see a director bringing someone in, but, you know, we interview a lot of property masters on this show and they like to be masters of the domain. And if actors are touching food, certainly they see that as under their umbrella. But of course, you're also bringing an expertise that presumably they don't have in their own portfolio if if you're going to be there to help. Definitely. It seems to be a, a collaboration. Um, I work with some great prop masters that almost always will look to me, especially when it's training talent uh, or picking equipment. Um, and the last couple I've worked on is actually working with uh, writers who had written something that either didn't make sense or didn't flow well within the scene. And so then explaining the, to them what the real process would be and then coming up with, with something that worked that was uh, super, super visual and still told the story, uh, but in a correct way. Mm -hmm. A lot has to come into play sometimes with uh, choreography, too, in tight spaces or kitchen scenes or restaurant scenes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great to be part of the property department. But I think in my experience, once the presence is made and you're there, you know, you get sort of pulled in and invited to sort of share like your restaurant and all, you know, all the things that you bring to the table that maybe someone in the prop umbrella doesn't have besides you. Well, talk to me about how each of you got started in this work. Melissa, why don't you kick us off? Boy, mine is, mine is a very long and winding uh, career from taking culinary classes while I was working at an electrical engineering firm to then leaving the electrical engineering firm and working at an ad agency where I worked my way up and oversaw production. And in the course of that, saw many food stylists along the way and realized, oh, I could actually do that too. Um, and I'm going very quickly through this to, to deciding to leave the advertising agency, but thankfully had made many contacts throughout the production world, including being married to a prop master who hired all his own food stylists, uh, to deciding to leave the agency to work on my work-life balance uh, because I had a couple small children at the time. 
And so food styling was a nice thing for me to sort of get started with because most of my projects, especially in the beginning when you're getting started, you work for two, three, maybe four days and then you have a few days off. And so that sort of worked with my be a mom schedule back in the day. Christine, how about yourself? Jeez. So I started, well, I went to um, art school. So my training is in fine arts and uh, worked as a, independently as a gallery artist. And to support that, I worked in restaurants since age of 17 to pay my way through school and education and rent and all that. So it wasn't until I was probably, and I've always followed my stomach, you know, wherever I've gone and I come from a big cooking family. And I was 30 when I was at Oleana in Cambridge under Chef Honor Sortoon. And it was with her first cookbook, Spice, that I got introduced to being a food stylist is a very hard niche, especially, well, and this is with editorial work um, that then led me into advertising work that then led me into motion work. But it's just, it, it was, it is, and still is a pretty tough niche to get into professionally. Um, I think nowadays with Instagram and other social vehicles, it sort of has changed quite a bit than when I started a long time ago. And then fast forward to uh maybe 10 years after that I got the call to do my first film and so that's 14 years ago so I've been now primarily working on major motion pictures um and I still do editorial work um with cookbooks especially I love doing cookbooks and um television um like cooking shows and such that are here and I could just keep chefing. So I, I sort of have a mixed bag of all sorts of culinary things being led by my art training. I feel like I am more aware of food playing a role in film and television over the last, call it five or 10 years, than longer ago. You ladies let me know, is that just because I'm paying more attention or has the craft grown and been getting more attention from the film industry itself. Has there been an evolution in the business? I think there's more attention starting with the writing of, of these stories and the scripts and having food being brought in as a powerful tool in the storytelling. And because certain scenes might have that need, then they call someone like us to come in and, and support that part of the of the day and scene. It's interesting to see food become more and more sort of pornographic in some senses, like when it's seen on 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 film and, and the lusciousness and like, you know, hints of like Food Network and Instagram and all, you know, all these visual inspirations, I think really sort of like beefs up. <laughs> some of these um, these moments that our food is included in, but I prefer, I, well, I shouldn't say I prefer. I, I appreciate both, but I love when food quietly is just part of a scene that feels natural, especially with period correct, you know, stories and places and helps tell a character's story that doesn't need to be like a punch in the face. But I feel like it's been busier you know, and that's really exciting. And it's exciting because more and more people have been approached. Well, I, I'm sure Melissa knows, you know, has this as well, but like there's such a heightened awareness of it. And also our craft has been, is a small craft and it's growing and growing and more people are wanting to get into it. Um, so it's just interesting then, not only are we seeing more of it, but also there's more people that want to do what we we do. Um, on film sets. So it's an interesting time for sure. Definitely. I, I, I will also sort of chime in with, I think that people are more aware of food now than maybe five or six years ago, like you were talking about, just because of the proliferation of things like Food Network and all of these different channels that are featuring cooking shows and wanting to integrate that in. I agree with Christine. I loved doing something like Mad Men where the food helped set the scene. It was organic in what it was because it was the food of the period, but it really wasn't the focus per se of the scene. You know, now moving forward to, you know, things like Julia, where 
it was a cooking show and now we get to highlight it because not only is this really important and interesting to to people currently technology is changing and and methods of filming and what people want to see and so i think it's it's great for food stylists especially those that of us that are are more established and get these calls we really get to do these fabulous you know, projects where our work is finely featured. Because for years and years and years, I used to talk about how much money I made for things that were never, ever seen. And now I would say a, a much wider portion of my work is seen than, than in the past. It's amazing that sometimes the camera will go right over the, like, it's also the camera is starting to pay more attention to the food, you know, like our, we could show up and have a beautiful feast and sometimes the camera doesn't even kiss it. But in the last five, 10 years, it seems like it's expected for the camera to kiss it. You have to get in there and you have to either being part of this. I mean, many of the times, although we're part of the prop department, I don't know with you, Melissa, I shouldn't assume so, but I work super close with the set decorating department also because it's, and I'm sort of like in between these two departments executing food for camera so that the prop might just be like a canapé, you know, or something, but really the rest of the whole room is completely pimped out with, with, you know, beautiful food. So, and that's a part of, also teaching people who want to get in or sharing with people who want to do this craft is it's not just this minuscule little thing that is in front of a camera as a hero um, beauty shot. It's also filling out rooms that you're responsible for. So there's a lot of layers to, you know, that is that changes and evolves from show to show or scene to scene within a show. No, definitely. I, I agree with that. I work as, as much with uh, the set decorator or, or even the buyer mm -hmm. uh, in that case, you know, finding out what kind of dishes do you have for me? I mean, a, a, a classic example would be a wedding, you know, maybe it's, there's, there's a focus on the bride and groom obviously and what's in front of them. And maybe there's a gag or a specific thing that needs to be eaten, but there's 200 background, you know, sitting there that need plates in front of them. And, and there's all of these, you know, waiters and and bussers and even bartenders that that need action also and or maybe there's a buffet or whatever it is they've planned so yes we have to communicate with lots of different departments um, and as you mentioned it could be with hair or makeup because they're squishing that uh, piece of cake in a in a bride and groom's face and we just need to give them the icing so that when the cake comes away there's a little on their face so we do get to interact with a lot of different great departments it's very collaborative. I want to have you guys talk about some specific projects. Now, with all the credits you both have earned, I thought it would be fun to organize this chronologically. Let's start with projects that focus on the past. Talk to me about some specific challenge you guys have faced on, say, historical dramas or movies or television shows dealing with the past. I'll jump in there. The, the hardest one when I get this question, I did a show called The Alienist, and it was said in the 1890s uh, in New York, but we shot it in Budapest. So there was a lot of challenges going on with that. Um, and I was brought over because the food stylists were there, uh, weren't familiar with American food to start with, then to try to do the research on what the food had been back then. It was just it turned out easier to bring me over. Um, but some of the challenges I encountered there were that meat is cut differently there than here. It was cut differently historically than what it is now. And, and meat just being one of, of many examples. So sometimes even just sourcing the basic ingredients you need because things were a different at turn of the century. And now I'm in a different country trying to replicate what we did here. And I had to convert everything in my head and Americans, or at least maybe it's just my age. We weren't really taught the metric system. So <laughs> even converting on I spent a lot of time uh, converting things for people there from, you know, <laughs> Graham. I'm so glad that you had that experience. There's nothing like working, taking the work that we do to another part of the globe. And, but then being confronted with some of these obstacles, we were shooting in France and um, 
set, I explained what the, the dish was and we needed ducks and all this and out comes, you know, the box and I open it up and I pull the duck from the neck, you know, the feet, the hay, you know, everything is just, and we're like, looks like we're going to butcher. <laughs> and what show was that, Christine, when you were in France? Julia. Yeah. But I mean, it's just like, those are like, Susan Spunkin said to me, and she was the, the person that I, I first worked with uh, on my first film, Labor Day. And she's like, always expect the unexpected. And so it's like, that's just how we have to, to lead when, when we're on set, no matter where we are. But, you know, as far as period, I love doing period pieces and the research that goes into it. I love looking at not just the cooking of the time, um, the geographical, you know, history of the time, but also looking at art from the time. Um, I used a lot of artists and um, catalogs from working on on Little Women, and I used that more specifically from 1868 for when the book was written. And so, I don't know, there's just so much information and thank goodness for the internet, you know, that we can mix research so much easier that we could put a few words in and then get, you know, a plethora of, of you know, information that we can make beautiful mood boards and design menus from and, and then be in front of people in meetings and speak with like true knowledge because it's out there. Um, and we're a little, we're showing a piece of history in our small, small way. And I think it's also fun in, in some of the things that we do. Um, you've done it like a lot of period things like I have. And then you look, you might look at a recipe that's coming from turn of the century or earlier. Tomato's not necessarily a tomato. Today, they're great, big, huge, beautiful, softball sized things. And they weren't back then. And I think that's some of the 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 things that go along with the experience that Christine and I have is these things are now so ingrained in us how food was different back then and and knowing how to pick produce and and even portion size yeah I mean flour was different you could do a big baking piece and flour is very different sugars granulated differently things behave totally wonky sometimes and that's where the time for prep before scenes is really important to test recipes uh, show and tells are important so you can show what is to arrive the day of and promise however many it is that they tell you that we need to to cook off but um yeah we, that's all part of the the research and thank you for bringing it up because it's so it's so right on well and then doing my doing my homework to to watch Julia since it was one of the <laughs> projects. Uh, it reminded me something of something that I haven't had to do recently, but I saw that you had to do. And I bet people don't even realize that when a mistake happens on camera purposely, like a souffle that falls, that's almost harder than doing the real thing. We know how to do it right, but now we have to repeat a fail. Mm -hmm. And so when I was watching some of the things, I'm like, oh my God, I bet that was harder for Christine than the actual final beautiful dish. It's always our so it's like it doesn't have to look that pretty of something, like it could be whatever it is. Like this isn't supposed to be a beautiful feast. And so you have to make things look terrible, you know, whatever. It's harder to make food look terrible than it does to make something look beautiful. And that's just because we're putting it in front of people and we want people we're, you you feast with your eyes before your stomach. And so that's just how it's ingrained in us. And, and that took a lot of testing, you know, all of that work. And luckily the, you know, on that stage, I had built a, a kitchen, a, an actual like semi-industrial kitchen that is a complete, at least here, a complete rarity. And I don't, I'm sure, I know I haven't shot in Los Angeles. I have no idea what your setup is, but that was a real luxury and we needed it because we had food coming out of the kazoos every single day, multi times a day on different sets and locations. So, so I'm thankful to have that space and have had the time to do whatever was needed. Uh, we have a rental house in LA for food stylists. That's much like going to a prop house and you walk in and you tell them you need commercial, you know, two door reach ins, you can get uh, electric ovens you can get propane ovens and it just depends on where you're shooting and what the studio will allow what you put put together but on 
the last three or four really big shows that we did, we, I also built kitchens. You had sent me some pictures of the one that you had built for Julia. I think you're still beat in most cases, most of the ones that I've been able to put together. But most of the projects that have allowed me to build kitchens have been movies. So they've been far more temporary than going the whole season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so instead of bringing in full size ovens, half size ovens were sufficient big fridges. But yeah, I would say out here, I've been really lucky. I did a show in Pittsburgh. There were three different versions of a Christmas dinner that happened. And one of them shot for 12 days and we needed a kitchen. And they're literally, even the catering company, equipment companies we called, couldn't give us what we wanted. So I finally called one of those rent to own places and they absolutely allowed us, even knowing we were only going to keep it for like three months, all new equipment and was able to build a kitchen. But yeah, in different markets, I, I don't have as much luck. What show is that for, Melissa? Uh, that was for Love the Coopers. So it was all about Christmas and there was a Christmas dinner with, I want to say there were 13 people, including two kids a vegan, a vegetarian, somebody who only ate meat, some no sugar <laughs> people. It was, it was a real fun one when you have that many and you're shooting that many days. And then, so I won't have, there won't be a spoiler alert on this one. So I won't tell exactly what happened, but there's a reason they have to go to the hospital. And then there is a Christmas dinner at the hospital. And then there is yet another Christmas dinner that gets scaled down. So we definitely needed a kitchen and we were shooting in a suburb of Pittsburgh and just commercial equipment for rent wasn't something typical, nor could I find a food truck to rent either. But I think we're finding, I mean, again, it's different, I think, probably, because I know that you have your own trucks now. Is that right, Melissa? I had my own truck for a while, and I don't anymore. Uh, thank you, California Commission, for, like, aging out my diesel engine <laughs> on the uh -oh. truck. There's always kind of always other issues in, in keeping things. But I'm now working with uh, one of the catering companies out here. And he almost always has a truck that fits my need that I'm able to rent. Yeah, awesome. Because I'm finding that I was on, um, I could know, Good Burger. That was it. And it was funny because it was right off after we wrapped season two of Julia. And I showed up and they're like, well, this isn't, you know, don't worry. It's just going to be a few burgers. It's not. And then I'm like, as soon as I landed two days of, I had two days of prep. I was like, this is like a food movie guys. Like there's food here, there's food there. Like there needs to be like, where, where's all this coming from? And luckily, you know, they, they, a day later I had a, a shiny truck waiting for me, but it's those things that in pre, you know, those first meetings that needs to be addressed. And I think it's becoming more and more aware when there is on food, like we have productions need to know or, or, getting more comfortable with knowing that there's going to be additional things like a truck or renting out some equipment and putting some space aside or renting a church, you know, kitchen down the street or something like that. Like it's becoming more and more friendly and accommodations I'm finding, which I really appreciate because sometimes we're in really like loopy locations, you know, here, especially with winter time, it gets really cold and, and we make it work. We call it camping. And Christine and I actually sort of collaborated, though we hadn't talked about it till afterwards, on uh, a show called The Perfect Couple, which she started fully well thinking she was going to finish back east. Uh, and then the actors and writer strike started. And by the time they finally got around to shooting a rehearsal dinner scene that was supposed to be filmed back east in either late spring or early summer, uh, they had to to finish shooting in Los Angeles. And now that I say that, is that show out? Oh, yeah, The Perfect Couple. That uh, just dropped on Netflix. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Like we said, we won't do plot spoilers, but yeah, it's available now. But I'm curious about the challenge of, for example, Melissa, what, what sort of continuity was said, if not in specific food and character stuff, that would have called for, uh, would have been an example of two food stylists collaborating? Well, in this case, and, and production sort of filled in the middle part, if I had known it was Christine, it probably would have saved a lot of time because we just would have called and talked. But a menu had already been established uh, when they first started shooting before the strike. And there had been dinnerware and there had been a, uh, the location, everything had been set up. 
So I would have had a better idea as to what to be prepared for. And of course, this was sort of tying into, I was going to tie it into like, what kind of kitchen had you envisioned for yourself for this dinner that you were doing? Because I ended up with a food truck and four assistants with me Yeah, in order to do it. Yep. No, that everything was designed. Everything was met upon. Everything was ready. It was all the dates were locked in. The, every, the trucks, were, everything was locked in. And then the phone call came. Nah, it, it's done. <laughs> so I'm glad that it landed with, with you. And I, I am so excited to see, to see the whole thing. And it was the majority of the film is based on Cape Cod. So it's a story based here and, and I'm from there. So it was really fun to be in, you know, familiar turf working and visiting my mom. So anyways, yeah, that was, that's a funny, that was a funny coincidence. I'm so glad that you, you shared that with me when you wrapped it. Yeah. And in between it had actually gone in, and shot in England. Yeah. Uh, also. So there probably was a food stylist over there that thought they were doing this also before. I think it was, like, it was a dinner scene there or was it with you? There was a book signing scene. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we started talking about projects set in the present day. Are those projects simply easier to do research on when you don't have to go further back? Or is there just a new set of challenges that you face? I think they're, I think they're more difficult in some ways. I, I, or maybe I just prefer, I don't know, well, I shouldn't say I prefer. There's a, I guess there's the difference between when you're doing things that are period and most of them then would be considered period correct that we would need to do like period correct food. At least we have reference and we can tell how it would have been served and what the portion size and how it would have been garnished and what would have been appropriate in the past. When you get to present day, it's whatever's in anybody's mind. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what the writer writes versus what the director yes. decisions, what the actor's willing to eat are all different things. So I, I think present day can be harder than period. I find pulling from things like Pinterest or finding images that through their vocabulary, I'm able to sort of, you know, show them the visualization. And so it's different than being like, well, this is my finding and doing the research where it's like, is this what you have in your mind of what is like beautiful and delicious for you? And if this is it, or this is it, then I'll deliver whatever we circle here or whatever. It's just different. I think I just spoke in a riddle, but oh well. And I know to to take that one step further, sometimes they'll create something in a script and it sounds really good to them, but they don't actually know what the execution is. But for whatever reason, this sounds to be like the right thing. And sometimes it's things they've made up. And so there is no way to pull reference. So the only thing is to talk them into giving you a uh, an additional prep day where you can actually make what you think they are thinking. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, I don't always hit that 100%. A lot of times when they see the execution, they'll ask questions and I'll say, well, you said this and this is why I did this. And then that's when you get the, oh, but what I really meant was. So that's why I think present day can be hard because the examples don't always necessarily exist. And my drawing skills are only so good. So sometimes it's just easier to make the food. And have them taste it because they need to, people most of the time eat what we're preparing. We're, they're, they're personal chefs for the however many hours or days that they're being presented. <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of trust that is part of that too, that people have in, in the role of, quote unquote, food stylists. I mean, the stylist point, part of the job is like in technical terms, it's like the last point of execution of the camera hitting the plate of food or whatever it is. But up until that point, we're wearing so many different hats. And one of those very important hats is like being someone's personal chef and like making salmon into mango, right? Like you, you helped me with that on, on don't look up you know, things so people can actually enjoy what's in front of them because they're being asked and, and expected to eat on camera. And that's, for some people, can be really daunting. They don't want to be eating all day on camera. And if they do, it's something that they can stomach and they can enjoy. 
that was actually something I thought of when I was watching Julia. Um, and I, the camera didn't really catch it. So I was trying to, it was one of the scenes in the first season and they're eating oysters. Oh yeah. I, and I never saw a real oyster. Did you make fake oysters? Did they eat real ones? Did the camera not catch it? Uh, at the Union Oyster House, I think it was, yeah. it was Julia and uh, Judith Jones sitting at the bar. No, they were eating it. But what's interesting, even with the show as robust in the character of food, it took a really long time for everyone to be on that page of understanding like that succulence of, of slurping a, an oyster and to take the time to have that <laughs> captured on film, you know, because that is, that was all who Julia was and Judith Jones, like, and every, pretty much everyone else, like they lived for food and every, every taste bud needs to be represented. And so, yeah, they were totally, everything is real. I think the only, there was one fake thing I will say is that in the souffle, the hero souffle that we did, that didn't sink, that was, uh, we used a Japanese cheesecake recipe and married it with Julia Child's souffle recipe. And that's what allowed it to stay firm. So that was like a little chemistry trick, but yeah, they, they ate like Queens that day. <laughs> all the love, all the oysters. And then, you know what? Everyone else, you know, because that's another part of it too. Like once that scene wraps, everyone's like a seagull. You know, they come in, the director's in, the actor, other actors are in, the crew, got, ADs are always first set at the table. What? No, that can't be. Not not us. Yes. We love, we love feeding you. <laughs> um, but it's, it's interesting, you know, the experience I've had in, I've only been asked to, to make real food. I'm very, very rarely asked to make fake food. And if it is, it's like a cake or, you know, like a stand in foam, you know, stage cake or something like that. So I guess it has its challenges, but just showing up as a caterer or as a restaurant owner, just making safe, fresh food over and over and over and over again. So oysters, like I said, are one of the things that I have made a lot of that were fake. And part of the reason, and people may or may not be aware of it, but we can't harm any animal, which would include an oyster mm -hmm. on camera. So whenever there are oyster shucking scenes, I will have to get oyster shells and I have to prove where they were sourced from, that they were not, you know, real, they, they weren't live oysters when they got to me. And I will have to make fake oysters to sit inside them, seal them, and then that's what they shuck on set. And they also taste food too, because I've made them for actors to eat that were vegan. But you're right, because this law that went into, um, uh, so sorry, the animal... The Animal Humane Society. Humane Society, thank you so much. That came into fruition here in New England um, during the last part of Julia, so a couple of years ago. And so... Perfect couple, similar, like what you're just saying, all of that was to be mushroom stand in, lychee stand in oysters, not real oysters. And we had to go back and get, um, yeah, all the paperwork, all the license, all the, all the paperwork. So it is, it is interesting that things, you can't show a, a lobster being cooked or prepared on camera any longer. So and luckily on Perfect Couple, uh, Christine did all the, the background work for me. So by the time all the shells got out here, they just had all their lychees in them <laughs> and we sealed them up and that's what they shucked on camera. And that's what they should. Yeah, it's and the, good. we shouldn't be killing things. I, I complete. But it's interesting that first time that we're that we were told on Julie was during the lobster and we had like a lobster wrangler. And we had a, a special little like area on, on stage where they would sleep overnight with someone watch, like to make sure that nothing would happen to them to then be on, on set the next day in, the, in a tank. It was fascinating. I haven't had a lobster since. Uh, so I'm surprised it's only been a, a couple of years. It's been out here for a while. And I know that I did a show in New Mexico, I want to say it was about 2016, and I want to say it was called Daybreak. And there, I had to make edible maggots 
Mm -hmm. Uh, There were also real maggots on set and there was a maggot wrangler and there was somebody there from the ASPCA or whatever they are to make sure that none of the maggots were killed during the filming. Yeah. And they had to be like, like where places where you would normally find a maggot, they picked up like a metal trash can and there were a bunch under there. And that's kind of what they harvested and put in a bowl. And then somebody later, you see, reach their hand into the bowl and eat those maggots. And then those were the ones that I made that were fake. And they took pictures of all of the fake stuff I made because on camera, they did look really real. Yeah, wild. Daybreak is maybe a good segue for us. So when you're dealing with the future, do you have more freedom to sort of just to figure out what people are eating or do you get into that same sort of crunch about uh, different people's ideas about what it ought to be? Um, I think when you get into another universe and I've also done Picard and, and we did, and Christine and I did don't look up together. A lot of what goes into food that you would see in an either an, a future or an alternate type universe, because I guess, technically a Star Wars in the past in the galaxy <laughs> long long ago far away, long, long, sure. far away. Um, and even you know like Marvel type things um, you start talking about food that exists on a different type of planet so now we have to make food that is edible for the actors that is made with obviously food we get here but it can't look like what we have here or be presented like what we have here because Possibly the planets they've go they've gone to, you know, they're they're like a desert planet or they're you know they don't have water or or maybe because of the kind of planet they are, um, all of their food was shipped in from some other place that they had. And so there was a, a Disney show I did, and the kids were on an outpost on the moon, and all of the food it could look like food that we had here. But it had to be something that could have been canned, freeze dried. It could be a grain uh, because all of the food at this outpost had to be shipped from a long, you know, over a long period of time from the earth to the moon. So I think when you get into to doing, you know, food from either the future or an alternate universe or, or wherever we are, the biggest challenge is making something that looks believable for that place uh, that the actor will eat and then when you get into certain projects sometimes the food ties into something else that has happened already so that there are certain things that can't be in their world or there are certain colors I don't think this is a spoiler alert but I worked on Star Trek Picard and I felt like I knew Star Trek fairly well as a franchise and I was asked to make blood bread for Romulan and so and we decided what the shape and the size and all of it would be and when I was getting ready to do the prep on it I asked if I could get a a specific pantone of red that they were going for and that's when I found out that Romulan blood is actually blue (laughs) and so you know, something that tied in that would have been important for me to know. And I guess I didn't do my research well enough. So it turned out the, the blood bread was blue. <laughs> and now does someone have to eat that? And I asked because of the dyes that a lot of times people, they cannot have those requests. It's a big part of that prop. Yeah. But then they are having to, to consume it. We, there's like problems potentially with, with the dyes, with teeth and tongues and, and all. You want a blue cake with like dark blue icing or whatever? Sure. You want them to eat it? Great. But we little r- rings around their veneers or their tongue is going to be a, a very specific color. Um, they did eat the bread, but luckily it was dry enough that it, it yeah, really yeah. didn't do much. It also didn't impart like a crazy flavor. I was working on some projects with uh, red cupcakes last week. And the only way to get it red enough was the icing just tasted terrible. And it just, you you get enough dye, but nobody had to eat them. Luckily, they just had to be very, very, very well. I'm I'm intrigued. I would try it. (laughs) I, and I did eat it and my tongue, my tongue was very red when I got it. (laughs) 
Christine, before we start recording, you mentioned uh, doing your homework on Boba Fett. Any specific questions you have from Melissa about what you saw on food there? Not to put you on the spot, but I think it's it's- like a pl- no, 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 because I, I had taken I taken notes, and I, I just want to refresh my my brain. So I, what I think is so great is when we go back and we talk about food on film and it's we're under props and technically it's a prop and all this and then it builds out into set dressing and all this other sort of dimension of of the craft and then you have this in this scene in episode four correct a boba fett i think that a boba fett and so you have this this tablescape of a feast and you have what I went, my eyes went to first is in the centerpiece, just like a savagely like torn apart platter, which looked like it was meat. Um, and then you have this bone being dropped down into the grade of the floor to some scary growling. It was the so brain core. <laughs> but um, I love, I just like, that is the perfect example of food as prop. And I want to know, A, is that bone and meat real? If so, what cut of beef is it? And <laughs> if you were to roast everything, did you have the facilities to, to do that on site? Because doing large volumes, especially with with meat, unless it's like grilled and you could you know put it out um, of the space that you're shooting can get kind of tricky. And then we could we could go from there. But it was almost like I looked at it like it was Although it's on another planet, like just post, also just post apocalyptic in a sense, because I could identify some things on the table of leafy, of roots of some sort. I mean, you can rattle off the menu because I'm just, but I was like. That particular episode was shot post COVID and pretty close post COVID. So, yes, I had a kitchen. But what was interesting is that because of the COVID rules at the time, Everybody had a very specific space on stage that they had taped off for you. And then they put up these clear plastic walls because Mm -hmm. most people were inside their space and you still needed to be able to see them. For me, it made the kitchen like a Mm fishbowl. Everybody walked by and they wanted to see what you were doing and like, because they could smell these amazing things coming out of there. Uh, So I felt like, it was weird. There was a wall, so people weren't talking to you, but they would walk up and stare through the plastic to see what you were doing. And in that particular meal, he had brought together sort of the, the you know, top generals in from different uh, planets, galaxies, universes. I'm, I'm, I'm bad with that exact terminology. But they were, there was like a pair of people from different places. And so each set of plates was geared towards what they were. So there was a a character that would have eaten seafood. So there were seafood bones and part of seafood on some of those plates. There was another, there were other characters that would have eaten insects. So, and I don't remember if it got seen or not, but there was this very cool little, it was like, I don't know what it was really supposed to be. Maybe like the hugest uh, like rolling soup station or something you've ever seen. And they and it had this clear glass dome that, that rolled over the top of it. So since they were supposed to eat bugs, I decided to make that a terrarium. And in the terrarium were bugs. And then um, that's what was on their plate. They had, that's when you saw the like little green leafy things. It had things. And we just sourced out um, different bugs that were eaten in different cultures. And I'm very fortunate in LA. I can be from little Tokyo to Chinatown to little Ethiopia to Alvera Street, all within, you know, 30 minutes of each other. And so I was able to pull different foods that that existed uh, to fit those characters. And then the bone that was thrown down to the rancor was actually a tomahawk. And I just got the biggest bone that I could possibly get from the butcher. And then that just, we just left a little bit of the meat kind of close to the bone so that you wouldn't identify it as a tomahawk. And so that's what was, was thrown down to the rancor. I love it. So I love nerding out about food. (laughs) 
and stories. And I love, cause I was also just, you know, looking at the, um, the set dressing and looking, you know, I saw a lot of like the goblets and I thought, and I rewind, I reround the, the clip because I was looking to see, I thought I saw one was made out of wood. And then I thought, well, that would identify if there was, you know, trees where they, they were, you know, just to help identify what, what was happening on the plates and what, what was served. There was also this, uh, there was a great big, huge rotisserie on the side of that set. And we just, and I don't even remember what it was, but I just had to get the biggest piece of meat and lash it and make it look like it came from a different animal and was otherworldly. And I'm not sure if we actually saw that on camera though, but there were, there were a lot of food facets to that particular scene. Yeah, I love it. And the great thing about that show is that the, the resources that are available, uh, there is uh, an episode that had uh, a roasted Nuna and it doesn't, a Nuna doesn't look like anything here or a skeleton here that I can necessarily get. So through the manufacturing process, I was actually able to get uh, like the skeletal structure of it. And then I was able to just use like turkey skin and stretch it over and fill the inside with turkey. And then, so it was able to be eaten mm -hmm. on camera. But luckily uh, they have a, a great uh, a prop shop. That, uh, absolutely. Uh, I was just on a show that is a post-apocalyptic series that I can't, can't talk about, but similarly, like so I was asked to make an edible rodent and coming up with some tests and like having a really wonderful prop master who has this, you know, their own laboratory that they can pull out, you know, their 3D printer in this case and fabricate the armatures, you know, to then work with food to adhere and, and spin and all this stuff and then ultimately someone to for it to look believable as to being this you know this thing that's really something that no one would want to eat it's pretty remarkable what how much things have changed just through technology to help us do what we do and st still needing it to be put in someone's mouth and and chewed over and you know for 16 20 plus takes Definitely. Well, it's eye-opening to hear, again, more about all the effort that, that goes in. Again, while sometimes our attention is drawn to the food so many times where it's just an essential part of what's happening, like every other aspect of the filmmaking here, uh, there's, just, there's just a lot to learn. And then I think we're going to call it a wrap. Great having you both here. Thank you so much. Melissa, it was so nice seeing you on camera because we usually on the phone. So thank you so much. I know. And I actually uh, purposely changed my glasses and my shirt today or you and I would have looked alike. I usually <laughs> wear big black glasses and a white shirt. <laughs> but I know that's your look, so I changed. <laughs> the uniform. The uniform. <laughs> Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You find my contact info at our website, borderlineoneword.biz. That's B-I-Z. You can also find past episodes and links to all our social media, so check it out. Without giving away any spoilers, where next are we going to see your work? Christine, you go first. Yes, so I got invited to work on The Walking Dead recently, and I'm really, really excited to see everyone's um, hard work. It was here shooting for quite a bit of time. It just recently wrapped in July, June. Which show? Which um, show or is it the movie they're doing? Walking what's, Dead. The, what's, what's the project for Walking Dead? Walking Dead is like six things, right? Or am I? Oh, I don't know. I See, that's why I shouldn't even be talking about it. I'm not even familiar with the franchise. <laughs> you know, what I can say, you know, the court is that it's due to the contract negotiations and strikes. It's been really slow here in New England. Um, it's a really tough time for folks, some folks. I'm lucky that I'm able to, um, you know, along with the, the film work I've done all these years, like I'm able to go and perform as a chef or I do editorial work. I have two cookbooks that I've worked on as well as television series. I'm doing a cookbook next week. So up in Vermont. So like I'm, I'm able to fill my basket with things outside of filmmaking, although that's my greatest passion and I really hope to hop on something soon. I'm glad you're staying busy, Christine, but yeah, I also hope the work picks up. Melissa, what have you been working on? Where are we going to see your work next? 
Well, I'm going to say, like Christine, I feel blessed for the work I've had because it has been exceptionally slow here in L.A. Uh, I did two movies that I think I'm going to be very proud of uh, that will be coming out later. One is called Outcome with Keanu Reeves and uh, Cameron Diaz and uh, Matt Bulma and many, many others. Uh, and then they just announced the title of uh, the official title of the movie I finished, which is Freakier Friday, and that will be coming out next year. I don't remember the month. Also, because work is slow here, I've been doing a little bit of traveling, and I went back to the past, or back to the, I don't know what you would call it, but I went back in time, and uh, you'll see my work on the second season of 1923. It's exciting. <laughs> I'm excited to see well, good luck. Good luck to both of you. And this really was a lot of fun. Please come back and we can dive deeper into some of these specific projects. Thank you so much. Definitely. Thank you. My closing credits. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and to all of our listeners, I appreciate you. The Blow the Line logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends. Thanks again from Below the Line.